60 Minutes Rewind. This coming Friday, Jack Welch will step down from a top General Electric, a global powerhouse encompassing everything from light bulbs to locomotives to consumer loans to our competitor NBC. As perhaps the most influential and imitated, not to mention controversial corporate CEO of the last half century, his thoughts on business are so coveted that he's being paid nearly $10 million to put them in a book. He's giving the money to charity. As we found when we profiled him last fall, Jack Welch is less interested in making deals and crunching numbers than he is in people, picking them, promoting them, and challenging them. Don't let anybody get between you and your suppliers or you and your customers. Don't let somebody show up with a dot com. It's nothing. It's meaningless. They got nothing. In monthly sessions at GE's training center, Jack Welch is teacher, motivator, and performer. It's where he loves to be, surrounded by his young managers, quizzing and being quizzed. What keeps you awake at night saying, this is the one thing I want to get done before I leave office? I want this to be a young company, and I want it to get young in less than a year. To make GE young, he's making it embrace the Internet. Every division, every one of his 350,000 employees is under Welch orders to use the web for buying, selling, customer service, everything. The internet offers a chance to change everybody's job. You said that you can't push this initiative moderately. You have to almost be on the lunatic fringe. Absolutely. You can't say, let's take on quality. Quality's good. <laughs> I mean, of course quality's good, but you gotta say, I'm not gonna pay anybody if they don't get quality, I'm not gonna give uh, stock options. So you gotta go nuts. Is that the way you always are, or is this, I only have a, f a no, short time? No, 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 I'm always nuts. He's been nuts since the day he took over in 1981. Tradition-bound GE, founded by Thomas Edison, suddenly had a revolutionary as CEO. We had to get competitive. The Japanese were eating our lunch in the 70s. As a country, we had gotten too sloppy. The whole system didn't work. It was a command and control system that came out of World War II. All these things from the military that we had learned, and layers, and bureaucrats, and parking spaces, trimmings of office, oh, horrible. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. He got rid of bureaucracy, and he got rid of 100,000 GE employees. That earned him the nickname Neutron Jack after the neutron bomb that was designed to leave buildings standing but eliminate all the people. You were criticized. You were hammered, in fact, because you got rid of so many people. Yep. And, well, and you didn't pull back. No. You went forward with it. Harder. You know what surprises me? How many businesses you sold off that were GE? You sold off toasters. Right, right. Irons. Irons. You had to get out of those businesses. They were yesterday's businesses. His bold moves didn't just change GE. A lot of his peers call the last 20 years of world business the Welch era. I think he did a number of things that changed the way you run business in the world, if not at least in this country. Larry Bossidy worked under Welch at GE, then left to run Allied Signal and briefly Honeywell. If you were to rank Jack Welch in a list of businessmen in yes. the last 50 years, where would he rank? Oh, I think Jack would be one, and the, and the second person would be far distant second. You could argue that we're the most competitive country in the world now. Well, it isn't all attributable to Jack, but I think he's done a lot of things that other people have emulated in businesses that gets us to that position of being the most competitive. He made GE competitive, not just by downsizing, but by pushing aggressively into financial services, strengthening high-tech divisions like jet engines, and buying scores of new businesses like medical equipment, even a TV network, NBC. And he transformed all of GE into a brutally honest meritocracy in which every employee is ranked from the very top down to the bottom 10%. And you look at that bottom 10, and we can't carry the bottom, the bottom 10. We've got to keep, who said it today here, raising the bar? People call that Darwinism. Why is that Darwinism? Well, the survival of the fittest. But it's not survival. Sink or swim, you know. In the end, if they don't improve, they can't. They're out of here. The best thing you can do to an employee is early on, as early as you know they're the bottom 10, let them know. 
so they can go on and adjust their life and get in the right game, in the right level of company. That's, in my view, a kinder, gentler company than the company that winks at the truth. His approach has certainly been rewarded on Wall Street. If someone had bought $10,000 worth of GE stock the day you took over as CEO, yeah. what would it be worth today? It would be worth over $800,000. Yeah. Oh, my word. Welch himself has made hundreds of millions. He has homes in New York, Florida, Connecticut, and here in Nantucket, where he indulges in his only passion, aside from GE, golf. Good shot. His favorite partner is his wife, Jane, who was a Wall Street lawyer when they met 12 years ago. Here we sit, fancy schmancy Nantucket. You grew up, were born 100 miles from here in Salem, Massachusetts. Quite a difference. Well, it was um, not 100 miles from here. It was uh, light years from here. His father was a railroad conductor, his mother a housewife. Neither went past high school. Jane told us those humble beginnings are the key to him. He recalls what it was like. He calls it the nose against the glass. He had his nose pressed up against the glass a lot of the time when he was growing up. His greatest influence by far was his mother. He was an only child. Yes, and he was born to her late in life. And I think maybe she thought she wouldn't have a child. And so when he came along, it was her treasure. Look, I had this speech impediment, and I stammer, and she would just tell me all the time, it's because you're so smart. Your tongue moves, uh, your tongue can't keep up with your mind. Oh. And she convinced me of that. Oh, my God. I mean, what she just convinced me is... over and over again. I'd come home with four A's and a B, and she'd give me hell for not having five A's, and then she'd hug me. So she knew how to kick and kiss, sort of. Uh, she really taught me that in many ways, to motivate and yet love. And she taught him at a very young age to be a ferocious competitor. In the first grade I was coming home from school because we lived across the street from the school and uh, in Salem downtown and I'd come home at lunch in the first grade and would have a gin rummy game. <laughs> at lunch? At lunch. And she'd go, gin! <laughs> and I'd get so mad. She made him into a fighter in sports, in school, he earned a PhD in chemical engineering, in business, and in life. A couple of years ago, he had bypass surgery. Yes. The night before the surgery, uh, he said, tomorrow, if something happens and they want to pull the plug, don't let them, because I will be fighting whether you can see it or not. The stakes aren't always so life and death. He just acts as if they are. I can remember once he said, uh, Let's play ping pong for a game. I got 20 minutes or something. Ping pong. Ping pong. And the, the table was surrounded by hedgerows. We were diving into the hedgerows trying to get the ball back. I never saw anybody so, so competitive in my life. Neither had we, like when we asked about a 25-year-old controversy over GE polluting the Hudson River. It's all about that company that did something in the dark of night that dumped, the word dump is used. We didn't dump, we had a permit from the US government and the state of New York to do exactly what we did. Do you think I'd come to work in a company that would do that or condone that? I wouldn't do it, Leslie. This is nuts. I this... hope I didn't get too heated up on that. Heated? Jack Welch? No one ever accused him of having a passion deficit. How are you? And he spread that energy around GE, urging people on in thousands of personal encounters. What do you think? And thousands of personal notes. If I could, I'd have a personal relationship with every person in that company. I mean, it's, uh, it's what counts. It's what makes companies work. And you're the cheerleader on the yeah, side. Cheerleader. That's what I am. Have you become your mother? Gee, that's a... That's a great question. Well, I like, I kick butt and I hug. And when you win, you say, gin. Gin, exactly. He wins a lot these days. The business press treats him like a conquering hero. But critics complain that he forces his people to focus too much on the bottom line. What is a CEO's civic responsibility? Are there things 
that, that you owe society Absolutely. beyond making money. What about uh, preserving jobs in the United States? In our case, we've moved a lot of jobs overseas. We've moved a lot of jobs offshore. And yet our US employment in the 90s has grown 50,000 people. Well, what about NBC? Should a CEO say, OK, I have this network. We're not going to export violence and sex on NBC. We're not going to do it. That's not my job. My job is not to program networks. But he is known to give the NBC brass hell when ratings are down. Truth is, he knows a great deal about every GE business and every corner of the world. He calls himself a grunt who works all day and then does two hours of homework a night in front of the TV. The story will continue after this. He can do several things at once. Yeah. He can watch television and study. And have dinner, talk to you, and listen to the conversation at the table next door. Even with all that listening and studying, until recently, he failed to grasp the importance of the Internet. He says he might have retired as a Neanderthal, if not for Jane. She had been involved in the Internet for years. And, I mean, I just didn't get it. How did she get you into it? Well, what she did was she went to a, a Yahoo message board on GE. And they were talking about uh, me. And uh, it was all gossip about, you know, rumors and this and that. God, I got this is really fascinating. And I kept going in and opening up the message board. And, <laughs> to uh, see what they were saying about you. <laughs> or the company. So I got hooked. All I did was open the door and say, look in here. And he saw much beyond what I knew. He could see all the way to the horizon, you know. What he saw was that this new technology could make his big old company young and nimble. E-business is the reading, writing, breathing of tomorrow. He argues that if a global conglomerate like GE goes digital, it's more likely to own the future than any dot-com. These guys are out building warehouses. I mean, these hot, high-tech companies are building freezers and warehouses to ship little things around. I mean, we get all that stuff. GE Thanks. will lose a 65-year-old internet visionary this week. Other companies will gain one. Welsh has decided to become a consultant, a kind of personal coach for CEOs, a bunch of whom have already signed him up. Neutron Jack will become Guru Jack. I was there getting beat up and bashed around. You go through cycles, prince to pig, prince to pig, prince. I think I'm going to make it right out the door as, as prince, I hope, if you don't do something to me. 